most difficult period, although the period of totalitarianism goes until 1989, which had ensued from two different and yet very much akin ideologies, Nazism and communism, or applied Marxism, rather than focusing on historical details, which have been well documented by historians already, we will concentrate on how the ideologies of Nazism and communism use the power of narrative to shape or to reshape the identities of civilized people in Europe. Focusing on the Marxist ideology as it was applied in our context, we argue that its historical expressions of violence were not mere byproducts of an otherwise noble endeavor to finalize the proletarian revolution, but rather necessary or even essential tools of the new revolutionary morality driven by the vision of a post-theistic redemption. In section two, we argue that while contemporary post-Holocaust and post-Gulag societies remain highly suspicious of meta-narratives, they search for ways to fight an increasing dissocialization and fragmentation, as well as an ever more encroaching nihilism present in, in our societies. This we find a futile task unless we relearn to appreciate the narrative and relational character of human identity and decide to harness the power of meaning conferring narratives in a more in a positive constructive way. The abuse of this power by two evil ideologies has recently brought unimaginable sufferings to people in Slovakia, Christians and non-Christians alike. Current ignorance of this power on the, on the other hand, spawns fragmentation, instability, and or uh, confusion. Sustainable development and religious peace in our society cannot be achieved or maintained without taking the power of meaning-conferring narratives more seriously. In section three, we deal with the current task of public theology to reintroduce the biblical narrative of meta-narrative into the public discourse within a newly facilitated dialogue of narratives as a preventive measure against new outbreaks of violence and oppression in the present European society. If in the process we find out that a significant number of people have lost or are losing a conceptual framework which presupposes that we live in a narratable world, the church is supposed to strive to reintroduce it to, to this world through the life and sacrificial service of, of vibrant Christian communities. We'll move on to page three, section one. In October of 1938, Slovakia, in the person of an office of its president, Dr. Tiso, a Catholic priest, adopted some of the controversial rhetoric of the Nazi propaganda and tried to influence the teaching and practice of the Slovak churches uh, <clears throat> to comply with the principle of the Dritter, Dritter Reich ideology. Considered a heinous cancer and a barrier to a further development of the nation, Jews had to be excluded from the society. Those who objected were marked enemies of the state to be liquidated. Though there were those who resisted and showed courage and willingness to sacrifice for the truth, most people were too weak and or too fearful to react until it was too late. Tiso signed an agreement with Hitler according to which the German Empire takes over the defense of political autonomy and territorial integrity of Slovak Republic. This is a quote from the agreement, actually. Slovakia had to promise a compliance of, the foreign, of its foreign policy with Germany, including a military alliance. This included the infamous deportations of the Jews to concentration camps. At least 70 out of 90,000 Jews were deported from Slovakia between 1945, 42 and 45. A vast majority of them never came back. After the war, 
The official policy of the Communist Party, taking power in Eastern and Central Europe, was to suppress their political opponents and any religious presence by imposing severe restrictions on churches and other religious institutions. The Communist Politburo despised the Christian churches because they opposed revolution as the inevitable outcome of class struggle. Christianity in Slovakia had the allegiance of many people and thus became a rival to the communist attempts at total control of the society. Religion was thus defined as opium of the people and a popular superstition. It later became reluctantly tolerated as an insignificant private delusion without any real influence on culture and politics. The government authorities worked to ensure that the church would lose its independence and its social, political, and moral influence in society. So by virtue of the legal act from 1949, all pastors were forced to become state employees. They could conduct worship services and burials, but anything else put them at risk of great danger. All of the orphanages, church schools, retirement homes, homeless shelters, etc., as well as most church properties were confiscated. In every country, police and secret service were used to blackmail, brainwash, and coerce political or religious opponents. There was all pervasive propaganda by the state run mass media. The whole education system was also at its service, and so on. People were even uh, murdered and tortured under this regime. So two grand, comprehensive, and yet utterly fatal ideological narratives ruled the Slovak society, as uh, I, I documented uh, concisely, who, <clears throat> with a ruthless claim on total compliance of the people between 1939 and, and really 1989. But as I said, the worst years were uh, you know, until 1960. They both relied on ideological education, which, would, which we should rather call indoctrination by means of propaganda and manipulation. They both perceived Christian religion as an unwelcome competition, thus an enemy of the state. And yet, they learned from religion and adopted from, its, from it its rituals, projecting their own belief systems based on carefully fabricated and constantly reinforced, reinforced myths, such as the alleged invincibility of the Red Army and many other. Both ideologies were surviving in a constant state of war against real or imaginary enemies, blaming their own failures on these enemies and or justifying their austere measures against often mere imaginary counter-revolutionaries. And both of these modern meta-narratives brought about countless dead victims and unfathomable destruction. Our rather concise account of the events and the flavor of the atmosphere in Slovakia under the Nazi and communist dictatorships does not aspire to be a comprehensive historical report. It strives instead to point out the power of an overarching narrative of reality as a driving, motivational force behind human actions. Thus, with regard to the fascist government in Slovakia, we do not mean to say that the majority of the Slovaks were convinced fascists, or that the Catholic or other churches did nothing to save the Jews and other discriminated minorities. Rather than playing a blame game, we need to continue to ask the disturbing question, which was already uh, asked here by my colleague here. How is it possible that Nazism could have emerged and thrived in such a highly educated and cultured Christian society as Germany was in early 1900s? And then how could it have been so readily adopted in a clerical fascist form by the Slovak society or by the German society or the Austrian society, right? <clears throat> And should we agree with the rising number of prophetic voices that our societies might be closer to fascism 
then we are ready to admit and that although the devil rarely show, shows himself twice in exactly the same way, our undying tendency to jump to final solutions along some scientific or political lines is just as scary now as it was back then. <clears throat> so let us, uh, let us play with this idea a little bit and let us dissect the, the beauty, uh, the devilish beauty of the Nazi meta-narrative that enticed so many people. <coughs> Uh, it really may sound enticing to those flirting with the Nietzschean nihilism. Uh, we see this plainly from the following summary of Gene Bates' penetrating analysis of the roots of, and power of, of the Nazi ideology. Due to its adoration of, of the power to dominate and its emphasis on the connection of blood and the soil, Nazism can be described as a renewal of paganism in traditionally Christian European culture. It is a coherent system, a worldview, that uses racial chauvinism, social Darwinism, and nihilistic existentialism to create the idea of a superhuman, the Übermensch. There has been competition by the human races in the history of the world to gain adequate Lebensraum. Wars in this struggle are the necessary and inevitable mediators of progress, understood in terms of a social evolution based on the advancement of one particular race over against uh, other inferior races. Wars are inevitable because they will, because the will and ability of one dominant race to rule and subdue other inferior races will logically and inevitably develop this, co develop this causing armed conflict with uh, neighboring nations. A person's identity under this neo-pagan ideology is an illusion until they find their identity in a nation, nation, that is, folk. This nation, comprised of individuals of pure German blood, is, this, is, a, is a new god to whom much has to be sacrificed. Individual human rights are illusory or even dangerous, whereas propaganda and manipulation of the masses are useful tools in promoting the well-being of a nation. If the term human person is an illusion, everyone had better find their identity in a Volkstaat, in a people state. If society creates an individual, then let it be and let all the respect toward human rights be substituted by propaganda. Let it manipulate humans and make them into what we, the government, want. If it is power alone that stands behind all the institutions, let us take this power. If there is no overarching truth valid for all people, if race is the, is the determining value, let us evaluate all of the ideas in the light of the racial interests and usefulness. If societies are, in, in essence, racially based, let us be racists and let us try to rule over other races and people. Such extreme right danger is obviously accompanied by its extreme left alternative, which appears to be even more attractive to and uh, attractive, and therefore is intellectually legitimized by much of the academia in the West. To many intellectuals today, Marxism continues to be a desirable secular version of the Bible proclaimed kingdom of God in which the politically emancipated and the, the new ideology liberated humanity assumes God's place and in which salvation consists exclusively of the imminent dimension. Uh, in fact, we can observe acute resemblances between Marxism and Christianity, thus perceiving Marxism as a Christian heresy. The fall into sin is replaced by the alienation affected by the division of labor. Ruthless critique of religions and philosophies replaces the Christian prophetic struggle against sin. The hope of the coming messianic figure is replaced by the anticipation of the liberating proletariat, and we could go on and on. So in general, Marxism follows Christianity step by step in the meta-narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and final salvation, yet without God or the kingdom of God, which is how he points out. 
No, we don't have much time to, to go um, into, uh, into details here, but uh, skipping over to section, section two, uh, page eight, we'll talk briefly about uh, a qualified appreciation of meta-narratives today. Each of the three socio-economic and political visions of reality that followed and built upon the Enlightenment, Marxism, Fascism, and democratic capitalism, propagated their own narratives of reality that aspired to attain the level of an overarching meta-story. Each of them brought a certain level of order and promised to usher a kingdom of heaven on earth to its adherents. Humanity's hope for secular salvation, however, died, it died in the trenches of the two world wars, was shattered in the Siberian gulags, was seriously wounded, some would say, died in the stock market crashes of 1930s and more recently in, in the crises of, you know, after 2008 and many times in between. Thus, in place of a normative meta-narrative, many in the West adopted a hermeneutic of suspicion instead with regards to big narratives, political, cultural, religious, or even scientific, though human hopes in science seem to be somewhat resurgent today. The world as we perceive it in the postmodern West no longer seems to have a narratable character. Skip to page nine. Uh, <clears throat> So the question is, how do we develop sound ethical foundations for multicultural societies in Europe today? Uh, and, and also the question is, can we dilute it down to a common respect for life and some individual human rights? Uh, and many people today would say that this would not be enough. Uh, I quoted their, we quoted their Robert, Robert Jensen, for example. The world needs a story, not an unfounded myth, but rather a believable story. It needs a viable, realistic narrative anchored in history and directed to eschatology. Or more precisely, to an eschatological hope founded on a trustworthy promise. In fact, I quote Jensen here, the way in which the modern West has talked about human life supposes that an omniscient historian could write a universal history. And that this is so because the universe with its inclu with inclusion of our lives is in fact a story written by a sort of omnipotent novelist. And we go on to argue that we must we should not underestimate the power of, of narratives, the power of language, and the power of the, the meaning imparting uh, power of narratives, which annihilates old and create new social realities, um, which is difficult to do in the West. It's, it's also something we argue here. OK, um, <clears throat> skipping over to page number 10, the end of page number 10. Here we argue that in a pluralistic world today, we need to engage in a dialogue of competing narratives. Instead of only discussing individual issues, such as sexuality issues, uh, or other ethical issues, we should talk about what is our comprehensive vision of reality? What is our conceptual framework? When we speak of secularism, you know, what do we mean by that? Because if we unwittingly adopt this view of reality that we live in an autonomous world that is not contingent upon the creator's will. It's, it's completely autonomous. It will move us in a certain direction when answering concrete ethical questions. Right? However, if we adopt a different kind of vision, in a different, uh, if we adopt a different meta-narrative, uh, meta 
of our reality. And we believe in a contingent universe, that we live in a contingent universe. That, again, will move us in a, in a, in a different direction. So I think the discourse, if, it's, if, it, if it is to be meaningful, should be a discourse of meta-narratives, really, and not of individual issues. What kind of world do we live in? And what kind of sources do we use to determine this huge question? Revelation, philosophy, science, you know, what are our sources that we consult? What are the life outcomes of political, religious, cultural ideologies that we can compare them? I think this would be a more fruitful dialogue than struggles and fights over concrete issues where each side presupposes certain things which it doesn't articulate. And I, we believe that, that there is a problem there. Um, my time is coming to an end. So, uh, yeah, in the end of, of our contribution, we argue for the case of, for, for biblical uh, meta-narrative, uh, but, but a qualified um, public theology that needs to propose uh, an inclusive monotheism that it embraces a created and charitable relation to plurality. Um, and, and I think um, I play with, we play with some ideas of standing our loss there. Um, but, yeah. Okay, well then, let me, let me read uh, a few sections from page 11 and 12, that's the end. Legitimate public theology needs a solid and robust theology of creation, which provides a positive theological affirmation of the material and physical world, viewing the whole reality as created by God and always sustained by the same God through his mighty word in the power of his spirit. Such public theology will lead us to inclusive monotheism, embracing the created and charitable relation to plurality while affirming the importance of the individual, singular human subject as a unique imago Dei. An authentic religious narrative touches upon the innermost aspirations of human beings. Through an existential relationship with God, the human subject's integrity and, and autonomy is authenticated in an attitude of trust. Such trust, in turn, becomes foundational for a robust, self-awareness of the human subject, opening him or her to hope for oneself and for the other, and finally to concrete acts of love. This needs to happen not purely on a mystical level, that is, without sacrificing one's intellect. Rather, honoring the Trinitarian structure of the Christian narrative, the doctrine of creation offers a sobering corrective to enthusiastic, irrational, and often fundamentalist renderings of faith, returning humans back to God's creation as forgiven and free agents, caretakers of the visible creative realm, including its socio-political dimension. Christians should bring this kind of narrative to an authentic, intentional public dialogue of narratives in which active listening and deep self-critical deliberation may take place. There needs to be a fundamental openness in this dialogue, an openness to be changed by my partners in the dialogue. Because if I go to a dialogue with a narrow-minded, presupposed position that you know this is the truth and I'm going to communicate it to the others, uh, that's not really a dialogue. The truth, <clears throat> the church has a distinct story and a promise to live by and to share. If we truly find ourselves in a situation where the necessary conceptual framework connected with the presupposition that we live in a narratable world is missing, then Christian visible communities must be that world, or must be that kind of narration. Neither human political ideologies nor fanatical strands of religious fundamentalism will offer a better alternative. Humans are social beings who derive their identity from a narrative in which they grow up and perpetuate in their own beliefs, attitudes, and practices. 
religious, cultural, and political ideologies will continue to offer their own competing narratives about the meaning and purpose of the reality in which we live. If human individuals and societies wish to be able to defend themselves against every kind of ideological manipulation, they should have a solid appreciation of the power and role of these narratives in people's lives, individually and collectively. Also necessary is a robust understanding of one's own narrative, of one's own tradition, that helps us appreciate our socially embodied existence, the roots of our moral starting point, and the reasons why one should not succumb to despair in a post-Holocaust world overshadowed by nihilism. Christian faith communities, provided they remain true to their gospel narrative identity, have the potential not only to show the way of the gospel, but also be the way by embodying the story of life and forgiveness. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor, for a stimulating presentation. A quick question I'll begin with, and then I'll turn to the audience. So your call for dialogue of meta narrative sounds somewhat like Habermas, uh, who, ta who talked about a double learning process that you're familiar with. Can you give examples of uh, examples of what each side might want, wish to learn, or what they should learn from one another? <coughs> I think each side should first of all fully acknowledge that we come into discussions, into, into fights, <laughs> with presupposed opinions. And we, we, don't, we don't always acknowledge that. Uh, and so this would be the first very fundamental thing, which would already be very helpful in, in a further dialogue. Because this will tell us that our ideas are contingent, fragile, limited, derived from our scope of the world, our understanding of reality, and therefore they're finite, they're not complete, they're not conclusive. And we need to, have, we need to intentionally cultivate this inner disposition, mental disposition, but not only mental, to, to be open to learn from one another, because your view of the world, your experience of the world, uh, can complement my experience of the world and my view of the world. Yes, it, it may be competing, I may not agree with you, but if I come into such a dialogue with this humble hermeneutical approach, okay, that I have, my views are not conclusive, because my presuppositions are contingent, they're not given, they can be refuted, in fact, or at least debated. That opens me up to a true dialogue, I think. Right? And that I'm more willing to listen to my opponents. Uh, yeah. Questions? Yeah. Thank you uh, for emphasizing that the real question is how can we live together? Uh, I have two questions for you. The first one is about the biblical meta-narrative. What is the language for which out you want to translate this narrative? Is it the real biblical narrative as uh, you use in an ev evangelization process, or is it a translation with philosophical concepts from non-believers? And the second one is uh, linked with the Slovakian experience. Do you feel that the communist that you have there was a real uh, was, was real a process of secularization, of radical secularization? Did communism, as it was leaving your country, really secularize society? Yeah, both questions are wonderful, and we could spend the whole day debating them, right? To your first question, and thank you, by the way. To your first question, I would say it depends on the context. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't say, you know, either or. There are many different ways how to translate, I think, the biblical meta-narrative. And, and many of them might be authentic, depending on your context. So if you are uh, in a church Sunday school and you want to educate and, and, and build up your parishioners, 
you would share that gospel narrative in a different way than, let's say, when you are in a secular university setting, right? Where you have to uh, be able to express it maybe in a more philosophical language. Um, so I, I think we need to be context sensitive and we need to be ready to, to learn, to express this, to, to verbalize this, but also to live our, the, the, the Trinitarian gospel narrative in, in various ways, depending on the needs of the context. So that would be my, my first uh, answer. Uh, and the second question, um, you, know, you know, it's it's difficult to say. It wasn't the same in Czech Republic, for example, uh, as it was in Slovakia. Czech Republic was more inclined culturally to adopt a more secularist vision of reality and society than the, the Slovak part of Czechoslovakia. So, in fact, communists did not, uh, but because they won in Czech Republic, they overruled or basically, you know, made their uh, uh, their policies valid for Slovakia also. Uh, so. <sighs> I, would, I think I would need to know more precisely what you're asking me in your question. The society was not fully secularized, and, and communism, as it was applied in the Slovak setting, was applied under the heavy hand of the Stalinist uh, you know, type of applied Marxism that came from us from the Soviet Union. So many of the Slovak communists, who had good intentions, uh, you know, to, to help alleviate the burdens, the sufferings of the common people. Many of them were killed initially in the first decade of after the revolution the, because, because they were too liberal, okay, for, uh, for the Stalinist type of communists. Um, and many of them came from Christian churches. Many of them were Lutherans, in fact, right? And they believe that this is really the secular vision uh, version of the kingdom of God. And maybe deep down in their heart, they believe that you know religion still has a place to play in a society, but they couldn't say it openly. So it's, it's a difficult question that you're posing. It has many yes. aspects. Yes. Professor Barber. Yes. It's, I don't know if it's a proper question, rather common. I wonder if you if your paper is not too retrospective. As I personally think that we are living the end of narratives. There are no meta-narratives, even in, in the Christian realm. The, the, the rising church, the world there perish, said David Martin of the Pentecostals, who precisely don't rely on a text, on the Bible, but on the spirit that is as authoritative as the text. So even Christians, if you look at numbers and the uh, global tendency, don't uh, uphold a meta-narrative. <coughs> we are living, uh, it's my, 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 sense, my, my impression, in, in, in a world of micro-narratives. Uh, there is no grand story on anything but small stories on fragments of reality. No one is offering, providing uh, a sense or making sense of what you see, what you don't read. Universities who were supposed to be uh, and were for centuries uh, the seat of knowledge and of and the, the, the uh, power engine of, of narratives now are marketized, bureaucratized, they produce papers at best, not scientific papers, but reports and uh, grants and whatever, all over. Huh? It's uh, even in the best universities in the world, the oldest are, are, are um, diseased like, like that. So where are the meta-narratives today? I don't see them. <laughs> You see at best images, which may be epic, huh? 
as Russians invading Crimea. It's epic, but it's epic for like a month. And then everybody goes to Trump doing whatever he does now. And day after tomorrow, another epic image. But it's not really a narrative because you, you cannot make sense of it. You cannot dialogue. You cannot challenge it because it's, it's simply an image. It's not a text. It doesn't, I don't know if I'm, I'm clear. Yeah, no, no, no. I appreciate your summary of, of the postmodern position. <laughs> uh, and I agree with you that this is quite prevalent at the universities, for example. But I fundamentally disagree with you if I understand you correctly, if you are claiming that meta narratives as such are dead and we should simply adopt uh, this postmodernist no, I don't mentality. No, no, I don't okay. mean we should, okay. but I simply look at what you is think it's a reality. Right? It's simply that yes, way. It's out yeah. there. Okay. We have right. to deal with it. Yeah, so I agree. I agree again. We have to deal with it. And I think uh, this is not the way to go to simply adopt this modern, a postmodernist mindset and to give up on meta narratives. And the Christian, now again, <laughs> the Pentecostals or charismatic Christians, it's, it's a much more colorful group of people than it seems. Uh, and I don't want to go into details here, but let me just say a few sentences. I studied it a little bit, so, uh, uh, so I can say that, yes, this type of Christianity has adopted some of uh, the postmodern flavor uh, that you see in the culture and society at large. But most of the Charismatics and, and Pentecostals would still argue that the, for a Trinitarian faith and for a narrative of creation, redemption, and sanctification, and the second coming of Christ, and the consummation of history. So they would still, still see a story of the world of which they are part of. They would simply say, let's not be as institutional, let's not use as many outer forms, but the narrative is still there. And they would, they would say, if you want to be a true Christian, you have to be sort of almost mystically included in, in the fellowship of love of the Trinity and taste the goodness of God in these, you know, uh, events of, of personal revelation and so on. So they would uh, mystically, they would, they would emphasize a different flavor of Christianity, of, of your living your faith, but they wouldn't give up on the narrative nature of Christianity as such. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I think we have to sort of hold it there in the interest of our time. Would you join me again?